So it is the most exciting time to ever be interested in space, to think about going to space. There's so much going on and no one epitomizes that more. No one showcases that more than Kelly Girardi. So she is a social media star. She is broadcast all over the place. She's a fantastic science communicator, an author, a scientist astronaut candidate with Project Possum. She has done so much to communicate the wonder and magic of space. And so it's such a thrill to have her with us today. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us as part of our Women Blaze Trails Fest. And uh, yeah, oh, I love your background. That is awesome. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, that was a wonderful introduction. And I'm going to dive into a couple of different aspects of that in the talk today. I'm going to show a couple of pictures. I'm going to tell a little bit about my career. And then I hope at the end we're going to have time for questions too, because I would love to talk about anything that anyone on here wants to know. Um, so starting maybe just from the top, I thought I would tell a little bit about myself because that was a lot of things <laughs> that, that Jesse mentioned that I've done so far. And so first of all, I'm coming up on 10 years in the commercial spaceflight industry, which is different from government spaceflight. They work together, right? But these are private companies that are working to create access to space. So you can think companies you may have heard of like SpaceX or Virgin Galactic, companies like that, that partner with NASA in many cases to expand access to space and hopefully for civilians like me and you. And so a couple of different things I've done throughout the past 10 years, and I think what's most important to start with is that I'm not an engineer by trade or by school. And so unfortunately, it wasn't until after college that I discovered that I loved space and that this is what I wanted to do. And so when you think of someone who works in the space industry, I think a lot of us tend to think of engineers and scientists, right? But what I found and what I try to tell people is that the space industry needs all sorts of talents and backgrounds. And that's where I've been able to contribute a little bit. So I'm coming up on 10 years in the space industry. You know, as mentioned, I had a lot of different roles, which we'll talk about. But I am also a researcher now. So I get to test spacesuits like, oops, the other way, sorry. This one over here, my screen is mirrored. <laughs> like this commercial spacesuit over here, I get to test that in microgravity. So floating weightless in here on Earth, but mimicking a space environment. And I've gotten to do a lot of really cool NASA supported research in microgravity. I'm also on the board of directors for the Explorers Club. Um, and I've carried the club's flag on a crew rotation to the Mars Desert Research Station. And that was where I lived in isolation with a crew of scientists that were doing research and pretending that we were on Mars. And most importantly, I'm a mom too. I have a three-year-old daughter named Delta. So I'm very excited to talk to you today. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I wanna cover a couple things from floating in microgravity, working at a spaceport, living on Mars, writing books, being on social media, everything else, we're gonna cover it. But I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about how I started. So I, I wanted to make clear that one of the first things that opened my mind to there being a commercial space flight industry is that I met a private astronaut. This was someone who wasn't a NASA astronaut, but who was an entrepreneur and in fact a video game developer who ended up creating their own path to space. This was Richard Garriott, who is going to be the new president of the Explorers Club. And he went to space and to the International Space Station as a private citizen. It blew my mind. And I realized that there are more than one path to space. And so that kick started my entire career trying to work my way into the commercial space flight industry. And so over the years, I've done a lot of different things. I've worked on media, communications, helping tell the story of space, business development, operations. It's been a really wild ride. But my favorite thing and the biggest privilege has been my role as a crew member of Project Possum. That's a suborbital research group where we're training for space flight, training for suborbital space flight, and where we have an opportunity to fly weightless here on Earth during research flights. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how that works soon. But I've also had the privilege along the way to build a really large science communication platform. And I've used social media for that. And I recently celebrated the release of my first book, Not Necessarily Rocket Science, because I believe all of us can play a part in space exploration. It's not necessarily rocket science. And the next giant leap will require artists, engineers, and everyone in between. If you think about it, we need, art we need architects to design space habitats and space stations but we also need designers who are gonna turn those into homes away from Earth. 
And for every scientist, we need artists who can inspire, journalists who can report, educators who can mold the next generation of students into adults who are motivated and capable of contributing to this big, bright future we have ahead of us. And so that's a little bit about me. And I think before I jump into my slides, which are gonna show some fun pictures and talk a little bit about what it's like in zero gravity, I just wanted to explain, taking a step back, what I love most about space. And I think to me, space represents the best of humanity, the best of what we're capable of, the spirit of exploration, this genius of innovation, the search for knowledge, and this hope that we can survive our time so that the next generation can live in the future. And so I think one takeaway from this talk, if you take anything away from what I've said, remember this. Right now, this window in history that you and I are alive in today, this is the first time in 4.5 billion years that life on Earth is capable of reaching space and breaking the chains of gravity. It's a window of opportunity that we have to take advantage of, and it's an exciting time to be alive. Okay, cool. So what I'm going to do now is share a couple of photos and let me open up here. Do, do, do. Okay, so can someone, um, Jesse, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see what I'm looking at? Yeah, we've got your main slide up and your slide deck on the left, but if you go full screen with it, we'll see it where it takes up the whole screen. Should just be okay. one click at the bottom. You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let's see. We'll leave it like this for a second, just so I can reference some of my notes if this works. Cool. <laughs> okay, cool. So this is this is a photo of me obviously flying in microgravity, right? And you can see this is what's happening here is this is the inside of a plane, like you and I might normally fly to visit somewhere, except all of the seats have been removed on this aircraft and the entire aircraft has been padded. <laughs> and so that makes it safe for people to float around like this, which is really fun. So this was a flight for fun, but I'm gonna show you soon what a research flight looks like, which was a little different. So one of the organizations I've partnered with is the Canadian National Research Council. And I've flown on board a series of different research flights as a payload specialist and a human test subject. And before, before I show you what some of that looks like, I wanted to explain a little bit about how we reach a microgravity environment. How do we even replicate that with a plane? And what happens is basically this, a plane, like a normal aircraft, takes almost a roller coaster profile in flight. And you can imagine that, you know, the aircraft pulls up and as you're pulling up, you get these eyeballs in G forces that feel like this pressure, right? And then it levels out briefly at the top, it's called a parabola. And then when it pushes gently over the top of that curve, it eases into a 25 to 30 second free fall and everything on the aircraft is weightless. And so that arc, that roller coaster profile is repeated over and over. And in those moments of free fall, researchers like me can take advantage of 25 to 30 precious seconds of microgravity to move around, to experience weightlessness and to do our research in that environment. Um, in bigger planes like the one you see, I've been able to fly like Superman from the cockpit to the tail to catch Skittles and water droplets on the tip of my tongue and do a bunch of Cirque du Soleil style acrobatic moves that I would never be able to replicate in real life. So now on to some of the fun stuff like the spacesuit. Okay. So this is a little bit what it looks like, right? The, the aircraft that you see on my left there, that's an example of the experimental aircraft that I've flown on as a crew member. And so it's a smaller, tighter aircraft. And so we don't move around as much, but I do have the ability to get up out of my seat when I'm in the spacesuit that you see on my right. That spacesuit is a Final Frontier design spacesuit. It's actually designed to be worn inside the aircraft. And so when you think about EVA spacesuits that you see you know, astronauts wear outside the space station, those stand for extravehicular activity. It's activities that are done outside of the craft, right? So like spacewalks. These suits are IVA, they're intravehicular activity. They're to be worn inside for safety. And so I've been evaluating how these suits work, how they feel, how it is to maneuver really precise motion with spacesuit gloves on, which is really hard to do. <laughs> and so it's been a lot of fun. And I think, you know, some of my favorite research has been just moving around the cabin. So 
you know, a lot of people have heard the term vomit comet <laughs> to describe some of these flights, right? And that's because everything is disoriented when you're in the cabin and when you're falling weightless, things around you are moving in a way that your eyes aren't used to trying to reconcile, right? And so I'm very lucky to not have any sort of sensitive stomach at all. I've never felt anything other than joy floating weightless, weightless. but I have been on board with crew members who were sick and it does not seem like a really pleasant experience. Um, you know, the lowest tech solution is just like in every aircraft that you've probably been on in the back seat pocket, there's a small paper bag in case you get sick, except in this case, it's Velcroed. And Velcro is a really important ingredient and, and thing to have on board. It's the number one most important thing to carry with you. Because when you're in this microgravity environment, it's really hard to remember that you don't have gravity and that when you put something down, it's not gonna stay there. It's gonna float away. And that's very different from Earth. When we pick up a pen, you know, we think when we put it down, it'll be right there. But in fact, it'll be three aisles beyond us before we can even remember it. And so in zero G, every simple task becomes a really careful multi-step process in microgravity. If you unclip a pen from your flight suit pocket, you have to immediately make sure you're putting it in a tethered location or fixing it on a wall and then re-securing it immediately. Otherwise you'll have debris all over the cabin that you're dodging constantly. And I also wanted to share a little bit uh, about what it's like and what it feels like to be in microgravity, right? Because it's a really interesting sensation. And so you can imagine that you are floating in a pool, right? In water and your limbs are suspended. You're totally relaxed. And then try to subtract the sensation of water beneath you. And you'll have a really rough idea of what you could expect to feel in microgravity. It's like floating on water without the water. And so, of course, for some people, it, it can be a little more disorienting and, you, you know, they call it space motion sickness. <laughs> but I think in the best form of it, it's just this really serene feeling. And so one of the one of the um, experiments that I think was the most fun for me on this next slide, I'll show you. You can see this tablet that I'm holding. And so this was a really crazy experiment. I actually swallowed an experiment from the Canadian National Research Council before one of my flights, and it was a pill-shaped Bluetooth device, a really tiny experiment that I swallowed that was designed to track my core body temperature in flight. And so once that pill was digested in my stomach, I was able to connect the pill in my stomach to the tablets that I'm holding and track my vitals in real time. So you can imagine right before the flight how crazy that seemed. So I spent about 15 minutes just laughing about how I could pair and unpair my body to this Bluetooth device and just congratulating myself on having been born in a time where this kind of thing is possible, right? This is the future. So it was very exciting and it was cool research. And on the right, you'll see a little mission patch. And that is actually the mission patch that a friend created for me when my daughter Delta was born. And so before every microgravity flight, before we get into the real science parabolas, we usually have one episode of free fall where we get to just adjust to microgravity and get our zero G legs. And during that time, we usually get to float something that's a personal memento to us. And so I chose to bring a patch for my daughter that was right around her first birthday. So it was really exciting. Okay, so moving on, we are gonna go to Mars. <laughs> so I like to say that I lived on Mars because deep in the Utah desert, in the San Rafael swell, you see these rock formations on the screen and there's iron oxide that over millennia has, has just uh, colored these rocks red. And so it really does look like you're on Mars. And if you see that little white habitat in there, that is the Mars Desert Research Station. It is only 1200 square feet of living space. And in 2014, I joined an international team of researchers and scientists from all over the world to come together, to live together as though we were on Mars. And the reason that we all went there and cut off our communication with Earth is because we all believed that space settlement was something that we could achieve and see in our lifetimes. 
and we wanted to help accelerate that progress. And so, as you can imagine, living and working with so many other people in such a tight, confined habitat, while also not being able to go outdoors or contact anyone in the outside world, it was a challenge, but there was a lot of fun parts too. We learned how to be reliant on our own skill sets. We cross-trained for things like first aid, because a really important part of this was making sure that we didn't break the simulation. So we all came together and we discussed, okay, if we're really gonna pretend that we're on Mars for our research, we need to set some ground rules about what would make us contact emergency services, right? For example, and we decided that only in the most extreme case, like someone's life was in danger, would we actually break our simulation and come out. Other than that, luckily everything went really well in terms of our health, but our days were really carefully scheduled. So we had different chores. My job was often to make dinner, which on Mars means I'm rehydrating food that has been freeze dried for storage. And so I'm adding water and it, it wasn't so yummy. I was looking very much forward to earth food when I got back, but it really taught us what it might be like for the earliest settlers on another planet. And so, one thing that really, really stood out was just how precious a resource something like water is. You can imagine on Mars, you know, it's not something that's so easy to get and to create. And so that was really important. Conserving water, right, was, was something that we had to take extreme carefulness around. And we also had a, a number of things go wrong on Mars, right? Early on, we had a total loss of power, <laughs> which is really tough, and fuel. And so not being able to lean on the outside world to fix these things really kickstarted us into self-reliance. We had to con we had to ration our water. We had to use the last bit of our so stored solar power to try to relay with mission control and try to transform one of the rovers we had outside into a temporary power generator to help get everything back up and running. And we did it all in spacesuits. <laughs> so every time we left the habitat, we had to wear a spacesuit like we were going on a spacewalk because we were really mimicking the environment of Mars. And this was an example of what that looked like. So we would go outside. This was our ATV turned Mars rover, <laughs> which is very exciting. And that's the Explorers Club flag that I carried on, on this expedition. And so that's coming towards the end of my slideshow. And I will show you just one little picture of my space baby. That's Delta V, Delta Victoria. Obviously this is not a real image. My sweet little girl has not yet been to space, <laughs> but this is what I imagine that she would look like enjoying her time on the International Space Station. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and I am going to just wrap up some of this and then take some questions if there are any but I wanted to share two final thoughts, right? We are at a point in history where less than a thousand people have ever been to space in the entirety of human history. And yet we have some different means of reaching space now, some new companies that as soon as they start taking folks to space, they could single-handedly double or triple the amount of people who have ever been to space in history. And that's really cool because for the first few hundred humans who went to space, the flights focused entirely on function, right? They had something that they had to achieve. They were making sure they were just getting there safe. They had a job to do. But for the next few hundred humans who go to space, we have this opportunity to focus on experience. And the next wave of space travelers won't all be engineers. And that's really exciting. I, for one, would love to see what poets and musicians and athletes and journalists come back from space with and what they share with us and how it changes their relationship with Earth. And speaking of that, the last point before I jump into some questions here is, you know, you can imagine that as different ways of getting to space develop, the candidate profiles and the things we think of of the right stuff, what it takes to be an astronaut, will change too. You know, thinking about Mars, that's further away than our species have ever been, completely cut off from contact with home. It's a different kind of challenge, right? And so who is best suited to make a home out of Mars? Like these are the types of questions that people are starting to think about. And so crew needs and the different skill sets are going to evolve too. 
And so it's really exciting to think about what that means and the different things that they'll look for, whether it's partnership and compatibility and personal values, right? We're landing humans a place we've never done before, things like that. And so I like to think that this is the most exciting time in all of space history, and we are alive to see it right now. And so I'm very excited, and I expect that many of you will be in space one day. That was uh, such a, uh, an exciting, enthusiastic presentation. Kelly, You, if, if people can find something in their life that they are as passionate about as you are about all this, uh, I think they're pretty set, which is fantastic. I think that this is the best uh, uh, example of this, uh, our comment from our third grade Brooklyn Guides, inspiring so many girls and women. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, feedback like that all over the place on YouTube and Facebook. So what an amazing talk. Uh, so yes, as you said, let's dive in with questions. They actually have a question to kick us off. And I love this to begin. An example of when you failed or made a mistake and how did you overcome that challenge? Oh gosh, I love this question because I have so many. You have to remember, I entered this high tech industry with an arts degree, okay? So I didn't know what I was doing when I first started. And I'll tell you one funny story that only now years later has become funny to me. In the moment, it was very embarrassing. But I started working at a spaceport at a rocket company. I was the only one at the company that was a non-engineer. My first day, I'm trying to learn, I'm doing my best, right? There was a note, a, a post-it note that said, more locks, L-O-X. And I was like, hmm, that seems a little entitled for this small team. Like they want salmon and locks. I was like, okay. It stood for liquid oxygen. It was the rocket fuel that they were working on. And so that was my first moment of, oh, there may be some gaps in my knowledge in this industry. And so it was very embarrassing, but we all laughed about it. And years later, I still think of that as, okay, if I could overcome a really fundamental misunderstanding like that, I can do anything in this industry. Incidentally, though, I think some salmon would make it like a it's just an exciting meal to have before you go to space. Maybe not the best, but I don't know. That was great. Um, and I, I love that you focus so much on art. And I think that this is really important. A message that we've gotten in, in a lot of our broadcasts so far is that you don't need to be a genius in school. You don't need to have the set path of science or engineering. It's great if you do. That's fantastic. But there's so many roles for artists. Nicole Stott shared her art earlier today uh, that she did when she was on the International Space Station. So really, really exciting stuff. And I think a really important message for, for girls and for people in general. Now, you talk so much about this Mars Analog Research Station, which is really, really cool. Uh, one of the neatest experiments on Earth. And Kyle joining us on Facebook, he wants to know, what is the next big challenge for space analogs? Like, what can we do next to prepare to go further and deeper into space? Yeah, it's a great question because, right, the big thing, the big limiter with space analogs is that they're not in space. <laughs> and so we can try our best to mimic what it might be like. But I think, you know, something like biosphere or like a biodome where there's actually a closed environment, and we've had those in the past before, but bringing those back, that could be a next level step of a really closed off environment where everything is being mimicked and it's longer term, multi year sort of self-reliance, like you are growing your own crops in there, you are creating your own water supply, you know, and, and something like that I think could be a really exciting next step. And we're moving in so many exciting directions, right? The Artemis program, which is coming up, there's a lot of need for these analogs. The Artemis program, you know, Artemis is named after the twin sister of Apollo. It's our new flagship, you know, US, a uh, space program that's going to land the first woman and the next man on the moon. And it's so exciting to think of returning back there more than 50 years later and in such a, a big, inspiring way. And of course, beyond the moon, then we still look to Mars as, you know, that neighbor planet that's calling us. <laughs> you know, we hope Perseverance rover is landing yeah. on Mars February 18th. I hope everyone is going to watch. It's going to be so exciting to see that rover is going to be roaming around and searching for signs of ancient life and hopefully teeing up the first ever return mission to bring back Mars samples to Earth. And so, you know, back to your question of analog environments, there are so many directions that we could go with that. I only got one small taste, but I look forward to thinking of what will be available in the next 10 years. And I think we're going to get pretty advanced. 
Great question, Kyle. And uh, Kelly, you literally answered all the questions about upcoming big space missions I was going to share. So that's awesome. Perseverance, Artemis, some really, really exciting stuff. And uh, do check out NASA's website, Jet Propulsion Laboratory's website, Canadian Space Agency, wherever you're tuning in from from around the world. There's so much going on in space right now. We're landing things on the moon from other uh, you know countries around the world. We just uh, have some probes going to Mars from the United Arab Emirates and beyond. It's, a, it's, as you said, just a fantastic time to be interested in space. Let's take a couple more questions. We've got some live classrooms joining us, which is awesome, our, our bread and butter audience. So Miss Spearin's class has the classic question. So they want to know, how do you go to the washroom in space? What's going on? You might be able to share. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So luckily, I haven't had to test this out yet, personally. But my understanding is it's a series of vacuums. You can imagine how a vacuum sort of sucks debris out. So too do you have a hose that's hooked up in the space station um, where you would be able to use the restroom. And you know what's really exciting is when we think about space tourism and some of the things that are going to be available to you guys in the next few years, they're gonna have bathrooms on board and it's gonna be a much more elegant way <laughs> of using the restroom. And so some of these next generation space capsules are actually going to have more private areas for a more comfortable experience in flight. And so there's going to be a lot of, of you know thought put into that. And that's one of the cool things about when commercial industry partners with government because they're coming at the problem from a different angle. On the commercial side, they're thinking about tourism. They're thinking, well, what would make this a pleasant experience that people would want to pay money for? And going to the restroom in a vacuum <laughs> doesn't really sound like the most pleasant experience that people would want to pay for. And so they start thinking, how can we make this more comfortable? How can we make this a more enjoyable experience, a little easier for the average person to do? And that's where we get this great innovation and new ideas and new ways of doing things. So it's, there's a lot to look forward to with regards to bathrooms in space. <laughs> very, very cool. By the way, you are, are killing it so much that we literally have our speakers from earlier today joining all the way in India uh, that are tuning into this broadcast. We've got an international audience for this, which is really exciting. Uh, so thank you again, Kelly. This has been awesome. So speaking of space tourism, I mean, this is, this is really opening up. There's a lot more opportunities to go to space. What's next? You talked about some of these commercial space flight companies. I know we're launching rockets from U.S. soil again with astronauts on them, which is really exciting. What's the timeline for this? If people are watching this broadcast, when can they conceivably think about maybe getting to go to space for a, a reasonable price? Your average person getting to go to space. I know it's a tough question, but what do you think? Yeah. And look, I, I'm always going to take the most optimistic version of this because I have seen leaps and bounds. If you think 10 years ago today, we didn't have a commercial crew program, right? The shuttle program retired, you know, we were relying on other countries, we were purchasing seats to send NASA astronauts to space. Fast forward to today, not only do we have companies like SpaceX and Boeing that are restoring access from US soil to the space station and allowing the US to put their own astronauts on board vehicles that are uh, US companies, but we're doing private civilian miss missions. One of the coolest things that was just announced is SpaceX at the end of this year is doing the first ever all civilian mission. These are non-government astronauts. They are going to be four. It's an effort to raise money for St. Jude's childhood cancer. And four civilians are going to be orbiting the earth for three days in a SpaceX Dragon capsule. How crazy is that? That to me is the beginning of this next step in commercial spaceflight and in space history where average folks like you and I are able to go to space. So the first four are gonna be selected at the end of this month, but that's a watershed moment because once we show, and Elon Musk, a lot of you will probably know this reference, when asked, well, how do I know if I have the right stuff to go to space? He said, if you can ride the Hulk roller coaster, you can probably ride the Crew Dragon capsule. And so I think that is a perfect way to put it because it shows that we are all capable of going to space. We're just waiting for our ride. And so in answer to the question, when do I think truly we'll all have access? I think opportunities like this are only going to keep multiplying over the next few years. And by the end of the 2020s, I expect that an average person like you or me would be able to get a ticket to space at something that is still a luxury and still worth something saving for, but it would be at a price point that's accessible to us if we decided we really wanted to save up and make that our goal. Yeah, 
Very, very cool. I love the optimistic outlook. I just need to build up the courage to be able to go on that Hulk roller coaster first, which I'm a little bit away from. But uh, once I've got that down, up to the stars. Uh, Kelly, this has been so, so much fun. I want to share two quick notes that you mentioned in your broadcast. So again, if you are uh, as excited about space as Kelly is, if you want to learn more about the amazing work she's doing, check her out on social media at the links I just posted in the bottom of the broadcast. And her book is awesome, not necessarily rocket science. Uh, again, a great way to learn about the, the coming future in space. There's so much exciting stuff going on. And Kelly is uh, one of the best guides out there. So hopefully you get the chance to get that book and, and learn a little bit more. Thank Kelly, you so much. Before we wrap up today and head to our next speaker, we're just keeping the fun going today. Is there any last message you'd like to share for people in general, but especially young women and girls that are tuning in? Again, this whole festival is built around the International Day of Women in STEM. You have such an inspiring story. Any last thing you want to leave us with to inspire some girls? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is something called embracing your multitudes. And in my case, that meant it's okay that I liked art and it's okay that I gravitated more towards, you know, different types of skill sets. I can still find a way to apply those to really exciting industries like space. So I would say overall, follow the things that you're passionate about, double down on the things that you're really good at and don't let anyone ever tell you that a door is closed to you. That's just an opportunity to create a new door and design your own. Kelly, that was a beautiful last message. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you tuning in as we continue this awesome Women in Blaze Trails Fest. And uh, I'm going to go learn a little bit more about the space program myself the moment I'm done this broadcast.